Hello? Oh, good. Great. Okay. Uh, we, we're going to cut the cowboy music. Uh, and uh, <laughs> we're, we're going to do our last panel. This has been, uh, for me, enlightening, provocative, and its great hallmark was its civility. At a time when there are no civil discussions or very few going on, there were people with radically different views, and there was a lot of respectful exchange so far. I'm sure that will continue. I have one announcement, by the way. Someone in the last panel said that the President had met with the entire Senate to explain his strategy on North Korea. Uh, I just got a little uh, message. He met for 14 minutes with the entire Senate. Uh, yes, John, he met for 14 minutes. Uh, so I don't know what that says about the last panel. The, our final panel is on the future of the parties. Uh, and let me introduce people briefly. On my far left, and this is no indication of ideology, Steve Smith, Schmidt, uh, a close friend, previously the chief strategist for the 2008 John McCain and 2004 George W. Bush presidential campaigns. And you've all seen him commenting rather wisely and sagely uh, throughout 2016 and beyond. Uh, Christian Gross, a colleague, the associate professor of political science here at USC Dornsife, author of the award-winning book, Congress in Black and White, Race and Representation in Washington and at Home. Uh, another friend, Adam Nagurney, the Los Angeles Bureau Chief for the New York Times and previously the paper's chief national correspondent. Another friend, I am exploiting my friendships, Ron Klain, who is the former Chief of Staff to Joe Biden and Al Gore and an important advisor to Hillary Clinton in 2016. Peter Mancall, the Andrew W. Mellon Professor of Humanities and Professor of History and Anthropology at USC Dornsife, and Dan Schwerin, the former Director of Speech Writing for Hillary Clinton in 2016, who also worked with her in the State Department and in the Senate. Uh, I'm going to start with a very general question that I'd like everybody to, to weigh in on. Uh, it seems to me, and Ron and I were talking about this earlier, that Ron Donald Trump represented a hostile takeover of the Republican Party. You now see Democrats engaged in recriminations with each other about 2016 and about the future. Are we seeing a collapse of the party system in this country the way, for example, we're seeing a collapse of the party system in France? We'd start there if you want. And um, I do. Um, I think that for all of us in our, in our political careers, we have uh, view politics through a ideological prism. And American politics has been divided down the middle of the field uh, with an ideological line that separates right from left. Uh, and we debate politics between the 45-yard lines in this country. If there's any Canadians in the room, you know, you would debate between the 48 and the 52. And we do it very hyperbolically. I mean, if you were to listen to the campaign rhetoric, you know, apparently the delta between a just and an unjust society is the difference between the 39.6% Clinton-Obama uh, tax rates and the 35% Bush marginal tax rate. Um, and what I think we started to see in this election, and you see this playing out in Europe, you saw it with the Brexit vote, the French presidential election already in Poland and Hungary, I think that politics is being redefined by a horizontal line. And above that line are the people who have benefited from globalization, benefited from the technological revolution, and below that line are the people that have been left behind, that haven't seen uh, a real wage increase uh, since the 1990s. Uh, we talk about on the coast the advent of this age of driverless trucks and cars. That's three to five million jobs, the number one living wage job of a non-college educated white male. I think the defining event of this generation was the uh, economic collapse in 2008. Uh, trillion dollars in bailout to the bankers above the line. Nobody goes to jail. Below the line, 13 million people uh, lose their homes. 13 million families lose their homes. 12 million people lose their jobs. And, and in Europe, you look at the transference of vote from far left parties to far right parties, and it makes no sense when you view it through that vertical line, but it makes all the sense in the world when you view it through the horizontal line. And so when we look at this election, you know, how does a Sanders voter you know, move to become a Trump voter? 
And we all scratch our head from our worldview because we're looking at it vertically, not horizontally. And what unites those voters is this belief that the system is not on the level. You know, it's rigged completely, completely against them. And I, and I think that when you, when you realize that one of the number one indicators of a switch from an Obama county to a Trump county is the intensity of and the rate of increase in the opioid epidemic, and you look at technological dislocation, you know, of jobs at the advent of the age of artificial intelligence, I think that this will be the fault line um, that defines our politics. And I think that you know, voters essentially hate both of these parties. Uh, they think they're a plague on the country. Um, and the one that they hate the most at any given hour is the one that they perceive to be in charge. And so I think if you see a Trump versus an Elizabeth Warren, I think you'll see a real legitimate independent candidacy for the, for the presidency. And, and last point, um, and I don't mean to filibuster here, but I, the blue counties have become bluer. The Democrats tribally have become more urban. The Republicans tribally have become more rural. And I think you have a, a, a totally disaffected suburban population in the, in the country that isn't spoken to by, by, by either party. Christian? Yeah, so um, I agree with some of that. And I think that one, one key difference is um, that Trump essentially is a third party candidate who took over the Republican Party, right? And so part of the fracturing going on in the Republican Party that is being papered over here and there, but I think will emerge more, is that he doesn't have any base among the elites within the Republican Party, right? Some of that's changing. Um, people are trying to decide where they want to be with him, but among elected officials, they're not used to dealing with him and he, he doesn't have experience dealing with them. Um, on the horizontal versus vertical, I think that's exactly right. There's this thing called nominate estimates that uh, Keith Poole and Howard Rosenthal, two professors, and James Lowe, a professor here, have uh, worked on that have shown that polarization left and right in Congress, Democrats and Republicans, is wider today than it's been since the Civil War. Um, historically, though, there have been multiple dimensions, not just one left-right dimension that's explained the divide. And so if you look at the Republicans, one of the reasons John Boehner wasn't that good at handling his caucus when he was the speaker is because he was not, he was a little bit too high up on a second dimension of political ideology. Um, historically, that dimension has been race and social issues. And so I think when we think about who's voting for a Republican who used to be on the left, who's voting for a Democrat that used to be on the right among the populace, a lot of it's race. It's not just rural people, it's rural white people are the base of Trump supporters. Uh, minority voters among Democrats are the base of Democrats. And so for Democrats to succeed, they have a bit of a race problem, they need to get more white people. They don't need to win white rural people, they don't need to win white suburban people, but they need to get a little bit more support among whites. Um, Republican Party is the exact inverse. They need to get more support among high income white voters who used to vote for them, and they need to get a little bit better among Latino and Asian American voters in particular. Adam, you have a view on this? I do. Um, I agree with a lot of what Steve said, um, but two things. First, I, I don't think we're going to go the direction of France, at least not for the time being, because the structural obstacles are just too much in favor of having two parties. It's just really hard for an independent candidate to win. Um, but I do think we're seeing party restructuring, and I think it's a lot more in the Republican Party than the Democratic Party. If you think about it, the struggles that the Democratic Party is going through right now are really not that surprising or different from what we've you know, seen over the past 30 years. I mean, in this case, it's you know, cultural versus economic, or however you want to describe it. And, they, and they've been resolved or not resolved in various elections over the years, and Democrats have the extra incredible motivator for getting together of getting Trump out of office, and I wouldn't underestimate that. So I, I think the restructuring is more, for the reason you said, Christian, more intense on the Republican side. Basically, Trump has taken over the Republican Party. Trump, I think, I mean, it's, it, I'm not being snide here, it varies from week to week, but I, I don't never consider Trump a genuine Republican. He sort of has ended up there with his tax plan, but I don't think he really is, and I think you've seen a lot of Republican leaders in Congress kind of just step aside on a lot of things they believe in, NAFTA being one good example, just to sort of accommodate Trump. And I don't know what happens after four years or after eight years when Trump goes away. I'm not sure the Republican Party stays like that. Does it still, can it succeed without having those um, Trump voters as part of its coalition? I'm not sure. So I think the Republican Party has a much difficult, much more difficult task going forward for that reason. Ron, you think the 
Democrats are much more coherent and in better shape than the Republicans? Well, first of all, uh, it's, it is great to be here. And, and I have to say, it, I'm glad to be back at the place where I learned most of the things I learned about politics and did some of my best work at Bob Trump's right hand. Um, look, I think that I agree with Adam that there are structural reasons why, for the foreseeable future, our candidates will carry the label Democrat and Republican. And while I, I do not think uh, there's going to be a, a serious third party uh, threat here, but what those labels mean is really what's up for grabs. And whether or not they mean anything at all, I think, is really up for grabs. And you know, I think our political parties are kind of like department stores. They're big, complicated aggregations of a lot of products and things. And we live in an age where department stores are dying, because people want to go shop for just what they want, where they want to buy it. And um, I think our parties are facing that, too. You know, much more powerful in the Republican Party than like the Republican Party is Sheldon Adelson and a bunch of other really individual, really rich people, the Koch brothers, all these people. We have the same thing on the left. You know, Tom Steyer and George Soros and, and other people and, 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 and specific interest groups and issue groups. And so, you know, I do think those are the driving forces in American politics today. Uh, you know, those are the things that make candidates win or lose, uh, along with, you know, their personality and all these other factors. And I think party label is kind of an afterthought right now. Peter? No historical perspective on this? Well, Bob, I'm going to jump in and say that I'm not going to try to um, jump into current day politics. I'm a historian of early America. But what I'm going to do is put this into the context of, frankly, of the revolution, which I teach a course about. You know, I think if you pose the question, you know, are political parties coming to an end? And the answer was yes. I think the founders would be delighted, right? They were terrified of, of political parties. I mean, the whole debate about whether we can live in an extended republic, which Madison tries to solve in Federalist 10, is the fear of parties, which they called factions. I mean, it turns out that was a somewhat naive view. Parties do emerge in the 1790s, but they're still so uncomfortable with the idea of parties uh, that you see the immediate response to the Alien and Sedition Act um, in the Virginia and Kentucky resolves. And what do Madison and Jefferson do? They restate the founding principles of the republic. What happens when Jefferson's elected? He restates the founding principles. We are all Federalists, we are all Republicans. They had a core aversion to the idea of factions. So I think if we could get in that magic time machine, which historians always want to take their students back to, and they were looking at this moment, they might say, maybe it's not a bad idea if we come to the end of the party system. Uh, Dan, are we all Clintonites? Are we all Trumpists? <laughs> well, I do think that, um, well, I would say two things about the realignment that we've been talking about. Well, one is that if you look at the results of this last election, the biggest constituency in the country is still for uh, sort of center-left techn techn technocratic solutions. Hillary got 66 million votes. Then there's a really big constituency for angry populism on both the left and the right. What we, what we found, and this is what Trump exposed, is there's very little constituency, actually, for classic supply-side Chamber of Commerce Republicanism, which we used to think was, you know, the sort of big debate for years about the size and role of government seems to have missed what was really going on, which is a, a lot of people who voted for Republicans thought, I'm fine with big government if it's for me and not for the other guy. And Trump brought, teased that out in a way that I think should make us reassess some of the debates we've had for a long time. The other thing uh, I would just say is that while parties do feel very weak, which is why um, I think we saw that on both sides, uh, partisanship is actually very strong, right? It's an interesting inverse, you know, there's an inverse relationship there. So that lots of Republicans who didn't like Donald Trump voted for him anyway because they couldn't stand voting for a Democrat named Hillary Clinton and they had an R, he had an R next to his name and they came home at the end for a variety of reasons and so it's even if the parties themselves as sort of conveners and disciplinarians and, and whatever else role that they play, they're weak as institutions. People's, the, the power of partisanship as a force in public life seems actually quite high. Um, anybody want to comment on anything that was said? No. Otherwise, I want to go on to a specific question about the Republican Party before I turn to the Democrats. Okay. Uh, as we prepared uh, for this conference, a Democratic shutdown seemed almost certain uh, because President Trump was demanding a border force. Then under pressure from Republican co congressional leaders, he backed off that. Uh, today, 
uh, the administration announced that they were going to fund the Obamacare exchanges, which was one of the big concerns for Democrats. Uh, the administration backed down on the health bill after the House leadership said, look, we just don't have the votes for it. You can't make us have a vote. Steve, who's running the show here? And who is likely to become, and is Trump likely to become a more and more conventional Republican? Um, I think that um, we're as close as we've ever been as a country to having a three-party system in Washington, D.C. There's a, there's a Trump party, um, there's a Republican party, uh, and there's a Democratic party, which is at its lowest point of political strength nationally since the 1920s. And so there was never a unified Republican Party, you know, at any moment after the, you know, the election of, of Trump. And it's extraordinary to watch his speech before Congress and to see the Democrats sitting on their hands when he's talking about clean air and clean water and for the Republicans cheering for tariffs and right, protectionist measures. And you know, the point that Dan made um, and partisanship and the danger of faction and George Washington's you know, farewell address and, and warnings, you know, this, this notion of, of that we've become a country of, of warring tribes, like that I don't think our politics are partisan as much anymore as they're tribal, right? Because I think they're disconnected from, you know, they're disconnected from ideology and we have an enormous competency gap, right? So if you look at, and I think Republicans have been dealing with this since the advent of the Tea Party mm -hmm. movement, you know, since 2010, I think Democrats are dealing with it now for the first time, and, and the it is this. Like the, like the characters in the Jurassic Park movie, meandering through the park is the Democratic elected officials, and they've just learned the velociraptors are out of the cage, and that's the voter. So even if there's a, so even if there's a demand, right, you know, on the Democratic side, we'd like a trillion dollars of infrastructure. There's an enormous penalty to be paid for any Democratic elected official who goes down to the White House and is sitting there seen as transacting and doing business with, with Donald Trump. I mean, per the previous panel, I mean, it's not the opposition, it's the resistance, right? And resistance means no collaboration, you know, which is, you know, not, which I would argue is pernicious in a, in a democratic society. But there's an enormous competency gap. I mean. We've achieved, you know, 240 some odd years in. I mean, we have across the board, like, achieved, like, peak incompetence, right, amongst our elected class, right, at a, at a federal level, at a state level. And so the reality is on an Obamacare. Is Obamacare going to be repealed? Of course not. They're going to give a six-figure tax cut to millionaires and pull 24 million people off an entitlement they've been given. Once the entitlement is had, it's never taken back. Is there going to be a reduction in 15% tax rates? We're $20 trillion in debt. We're going to spend $60 billion on the public relations stunt wall. None of this stuff is going to happen. So like, there are, by orders of magnitude, there is, a, there is a greater likelihood that absolutely nothing gets done than anything gets done. And is Donald Trump going to become more normal? No. I mean, he's Donald, he's Donald Trump. Um, but, this isn't day 98 of the administration, it's episode 98. You know, last Friday was, and I was in Canada, um, I was meeting with some Canadian government officials, and I said, you know, episode 98, the dairy war. You know, um, I said, I didn't know you all were the North Korea of milk. Um, but, <laughs> but what Donald Trump's gonna do is he's gonna bend towards the applause, right? You know, his North Star is being popular, it's trying to be successful. So will he modulate his behavior towards what he perceives to be the applause, right? That's his incentive, right, is to do things that are popular. We talk about like Steve Bannon and the globalists versus the conservatives. The globalists, we can get on a plane at LAX, which you and I have done before, and fly to Abu Dhabi and, and land in 16 hours. It's not that Steve Bannon has a point of view, right, that you would disagree on in a spectrum of conservative to liberal. I mean, I'm not a liberal, but intellectually, I understand, right, the point of view, and I understand where that philosophy is coming from. The Steve Bannons of the world are crackpots, right? And what Trump has learned in the first 100 days is when I listen to the crackpots, it's the equivalent of giving the car keys to Junior, who then takes the Buick and drives it into the wall at 50 miles an hour. 
And so when I listen to people who are steeped in reality, whether it's Henry McMaster or Jim Mattis or a couple of these others, then from an incentive basis, you know, people give them a cookie. They say, good job on the news, right? The intensity, you know, starts wearing off. And that's how I think you'll see, see Trump comport himself over the next four years. So I, I think Steve asked a, a race, a, something that gives us a really good question. And Ron, I'll start with you, but uh, do you agree that nothing major that requires legislation is likely to get done and that what we're going to really see in terms of changes is all going to be done where he has unilateral power to do it? Well, I hope so, but I guess I'm a lot less confident in, uh, in my team uh, to fight this than, than maybe Steve is. Look, I think that, um, you know, Ronald Reagan got a lot of Democratic votes for tax cuts. Tax cuts are super popular. Uh, if Trump really put forward the infrastructure plan the, that uh, he sometimes talks about on odd number days, uh, you know, I think he would get Democratic votes for that. The, that is not the plan he put forward in the campaign. It's not the plan that some of his economic advisors want, which is just tax cuts for pipeline companies. But if he really wanted to invest in, like, building better water system in Flint, Michigan, I think Democrats would vote for that. So, you know, to me, I, I think it's hard to know which of these many Donald Trumps um, are, are going to emerge from this process and where he winds up and where the cookies are and who's giving him the cookies and which cookies really matter. Some cookies may be chocolate chips, some may be asparagus cookies. But you know, the, the point is it's just hard to know where he's going to navigate this turf. What we do know, though, is this, and I guess I disagree with Steve a little bit on this. I think, uh, and pick up some Adam said, I think Trump is in the process of remaking the Republican Party in his image. And I think the party is going to become more Trump-ish. Now, Steve will, is a good man. He will hold out to the bitter end here. But if you look at polls, for example, Republicans, rank-and-file Republicans, have changed their mind on trade. This used to be a pro-trade party. It is now an anti-trade party. Donald Trump told Republicans, you know what trade is? It's doing business with foreigners. And you people hate foreigners, and therefore you should hate trade. And his party's starting to get that message. He's moved his party on Russia. Republicans used to be vehemently opposed to Russia. Now even rank and file Republicans are more interested in a better relationship with Russia. So I think the, the real question here is, does this traditional Republican Party survive Trump, or does Trump Trumpize the Republican Party over the next, uh, you know, next four years? So is, Adam, I guess I'll try it on you. Mm -hmm. Is the Republican Party now the party of Trump? Uh, and by the way, if it is, does it have to meet the rising demographic challenges of a new electorate uh, that will over time prove decisive in presidential campaigns? Yeah, and I don't how think, can it do that? Yeah, I'm not sure how it becomes the party of Trump, because I think Trump's around for four years, obviously eight years top. I think he's actually around for four years. So I don't think that a lot of the people who are part of the party until now uh, are very supportive of Trump. And I'm not sure that the people that Trump bought into the party for this election to win those three states are going to necessarily stick around. So that's what I meant before about the party going through this big sort of crisis now. I think it's got to kind of reinvent where it is. And um, will, like, sort of the traditional Republican sort of um, base, not the base, traditional establishment side of the party come back? Does it matter anymore? I, I, I'm just not sure. But I don't think it's a party of Trump anymore. I don't think we'll be talking about it that way in eight years. Christian? Yeah, I mean, it's the, it's the party of Trump in the sense that the president, when there's unified government, is identified by voters as the leader of the party. Um, I mean, one thing to me that's really interesting about Trump is his low approval rating, right? That's one of the cookies that's not doing so well, um, other than amongst his supporters and Republicans. But um, usually you get a Democrat who's a president replaced by a Republican. You have a flurry of legislative activity if the Congress is controlled by your party. Um, that's the honeymoon period. We don't have that right now, even though there's a Republican-controlled Congress and a Republican in the White House. And um, I think part of it is due to the, the lack of experience that Trump has, but I also think part of it is this, this big divide in the party um, where they're the, the leaders of Congress, they want tax cuts, they want some standard Republican policy, but they have to fit in all these other issues that Trump is, um, is going for. And so in some ways, I think it is the party of Trump, at least for the next couple of years, and certainly in the 2018 midterm elections. So we don't really know. We, we don't have a consensus on 
the future of the Republican Party, and it's up for grabs in one way or another. Peter, how do parties remake themselves? Well, I thought I was about to jump in on that. I mean, some of this is not at all surprising if you look at it historically, right? I mean, you'd have to say the party of Trump is not the party of Lincoln. I mean, there's been some radical change since uh, the party formed. I mean, I think the interesting sort of moment that we're in, uh, you know, is we're in this time of, of deep partisanship, of tribal politics. I think that's a good, really good way of phrasing this. Um, where people just sort of identify on some deep level with one of these party labels. And it seems that we're just so stuck in this, in this binary that, you know, when you, we walk into an election booth, R or D or whatever we're going to go, you know, at some point, and maybe Trump is, the, is really the change agent here, at some point people will say R and D don't work. This will evolve. Trump, I don't know, what's the word, hijacked the Republican Party. Either p others will come back and take it back, or they'll go somewhere else. I mean, over the long term, that is logically what would happen. So no. historically, this doesn't seem all that shocking. It's shocking to live through it. I think, um, look, the Democratic Party is the, is, the, is the oldest political party in the world, and the Republican Party is the, is the third. I, I do agree that there are structural impediments to a third party, but that's different than an independent candidacy uh, for the presidency that very, very quickly, I think, depending on who the Democratic nominee is in four years, could be at 40 percent of the vote. Um, and so I think that one of the things when we look structurally at what's going on is that the party of Lincoln, the Republican Party, founded in 1850. Uh, is by 1858 the majority party in the north and west of the country. And the day that Lyndon Johnson signs the Civil Rights Act, there's three elected Republicans in this country south of the Mason-Dixon line. Um, and today, it is, it is unmistakably the country's southern party. Um, and the parties are no, are, are, have never been, had never been, but are today, uh, they didn't used to be ideologically and re regionally homogenous. You had liberal Republicans in the Northeast. Ronald Reagan could do tax reform with a conservative Democrat from Texas named Phil Graham, and 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 all of that, all of that is all of that is out. But I but I do think that when you think about the parties and you think about it through a tribal lens, uh, contempt is a reciprocal emotion, and. I don't know that these Republican voters, right, like Trump so much, but they sure as hell hate the people who explain Trump's election by attacking his voters and calling them racists and homophobes and misogynists and every other label you can under the book. And, and I'll say this, um, the Democrats, as a, as a strategic issue, um, have an enormous elitism problem. Uh, they have a coastal elitism problem. And if you go to Silicon Valley, you couldn't find people more out of touch with the lives of average Americans than if they lived on the moon base on Jupiter that Newt Gingrich built in 1996. <laughs> no, so I'm kidding, <laughs> to digress. But, I, um, but, but that contempt, and, and the truth of it is, Right? And I live in Park City, Utah, and I spend a lot of time in Manhattan and a lot of time in the, in the Bay Area in Los Angeles. People at the dinner parties, people in the conversations, deplorable is exactly how they feel about these people who do the dirty jobs, right? Don't have the fancy college degree. And Ronald Reagan in 1980, when he ran against Jimmy Carter, he didn't attack the Carter voter. He created a permissive environment for them to cross back over without repudiating their last vote. He asked a simple question. Are you better off than you were four years ago? And so the cultural condescension, right, is like a magnet under the compass. It's skewing the readings. And the division in the country along that axis has a lot to do with the division in Washington, D.C., you know, that is not being driven by 
ideological differences on policy. And I just think it's a huge component of what's happening in the country. Can I say one thing? I think, um, I don't disagree with you, Steve, but I think the contempt goes both ways. And I think East Coast elites, West Coast elites, and that includes a lot of people here, don't realize that. But I think if you're out in the country, you realize yeah, that there is much. Who's got, who's got the power? Right, who's got right the now, power? that would be the Donald that would, not J. Here. Trump. Yeah, not no, here. No, 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 no. Mitch McConnell you're missing, you're missing and Paul Ryan. No, I get your point. I agree, I agree with you, but who's I'm just got, saying. Who's got the power, right, not politically in the elected official? Which group? Is it Youngstown, Ohio, or is it Silicon Valley? Is it New York City, right, or is it, you know, someplace in Huntington, West Virginia, right? And so. You have a third of the country. So what, you think you say Silicon Valley has the power now? I don't think, I think it does I anymore. Think, I think that they have power. They have economic power. They have. Right. You have a third of this country. Right. Right. That has falling life expectancies. Right. I, all that agree. Rising right. infant mortality right. rates, and the people at the top third, right, of the of the country, are living longer, living better, living more prosperously than mm -hmm. any human being has ever lived in the history of the world, and the geographical power centers of those people, Silicon Valley, right down the coast, that blue tinge down both coasts, both sides of the, both sides of the country, the disdain which, which they project. I mean, whether it's the Saturday Night Live, right, skit, right, that mm -hmm. shows the Trump voters, right, whether it's the culture reflecting on them. I mean, I just think the notion that there's not a disdain and a contempt projected from those people we talked about uh, that are can, above can, the line, well, well, wait, which the people wait. below the line okay. is just wrong. Look, I'm not saying there's none of that. There is some of that, and it's wrong, and it shouldn't exist. But I'm also saying there's a hell of a lot of contempt that goes back the other way. When Donald Trump launches his candidacy by calling Mexicans rapists and murderers, that's contempt. When he runs a candidacy that's based on uh, make villainizing immigrants, that's contempt. When he goes around the country and, 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 and says the kinds of things he said during the campaign, he is stirring contempt too. And where I would agree is we need to get this contempt down on both sides and find solutions. But I think you know, the contempt goes both ways. I absolutely agree with Adam on that. And I think Donald Trump is president of the United States because he stirred a lot of anger and a lot of contempt for a lot of changes that have happened in our country that voters find, some of which are economic, some of which is your horizontal line, which I agree is a policy problem you solve. Some of them is social, social and cultural, and Trump stirred that pot in a, in a way that no prominent national figure had. And by the way, you know, the only other metaphor we have for this is what Pete Wilson tried to do in this state a long time ago, which ultimately you know, he paid a huge price for. And I hope the same thing happens to Trump. Right, and what destroyed he's doing the Republican Party. I think you're missing my point a little bit on this. I agree with you that those are all the things Trump did. I would put that into just a plain old fashioned nativist race baiting, right, that's existed in this country going back to the Know Nothing movement. Um, what I'm talking about, right, is something different, right? It is a cultural condescension right, from the people that are doing well, right, culturally, right, not at a candidate level, for the people that are anonymous, right, that are hidden, that are not seen, right, that lost their homes in the foreclosure crisis, that lost their jobs, right, that lost the capacity to be in the middle class of the, of the country. I think there's a cultural scorn and I don't necessarily attach partisanship to it, though I think that culturally, obviously, the Silicon Valley, right, culturally is, is democratic, right, in its political orientation. But this contempt that I'm talking about at a cultural level, I really think um, played a big role in this election with those 100,000 voters across those three states. I mean, my personal view is that if Joe Biden had been the nominee of the Democratic Party, he would have won pretty comfortably um, because he understands how to talk to that community right through a prism of right through a prism of, of respect. And, and just to be clear, I mean, you know, like I'm not going to be on any White House Christmas card lists. I mean, you know, I've been I've been pretty direct and, you know, my disgust with, you know, the manner which they ran the campaign. But it's a. But it's not that there's not contempt that goes back the other way. 
it, it, it's what he did is something else. And I, I just, it's a, it's a different, it's a different thing. I, I want to move on a little bit. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to actually, I want to ask you a question. I do want to make a footnote, if I can, uh, that if you listen, which most of the people in this room don't, to a lot of cable outlets, especially on the religious right, there is a huge contempt for people in New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, what the causality is, how it started, who's most guilty, I'm not sure. But there is a lot of mutual contempt, I think. Uh, and Dan, this whole discussion leads me, and I'm gonna, you make your point first, and then I have a question for you. Oh, I just wanted to say uh, two things. One, um, on about deplorables, uh, and it's clear. I wasn't gonna mention that, well, because I thought it'd be too painful. No, I mean, um, it's clearly bad strategy to insult voters. Uh, politics is additive, right? <laughs> although Donald Trump did win by insulting lots of voters. So I don't think anyone would say, okay, go out there and, 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 and insult voters. However, and the best way not to be called a racist is not to be a racist. And so that would be a step in the right direction if people are so offended by being called out on their deplorable views. This, the sub, but it's clearly bad politics, but it happens to be true. And you know, for, it, it may be worth saying. Um, the second point related is there's a, often a sort of whitewashing of the, of the whole debate and the, uh, when we talk about the divide between the working class and the knowledge, you know, the elites, there are rich people in both parties. And it is true that in this election, the divide between those who people who had a college degree and those who didn't was quite stark and quite significant. But the Clinton voters were on average lower income than Trump voters. Most, you know, two thirds of minimum wage workers are women. Mo lots of the working class are people of color. They work in service jobs. They don't work, they don't wear hard hats and work on factory floors. But in our political debate, it's like we are stuck in some 1950s picture of the working class where it's all, you know, good union jobs that are gonna get, you know, shipped overseas. And it's, the country doesn't look like that anymore and our, our politics doesn't, hasn't caught up. So there are people like that, and many of them were Trump voters, but we should, when we talk about sort of the rich people voting, for, the elites voting for Democrats, and the sort of hard scrabble, invisible, working class people voting for Trump, we just, we, we whitewash out lots and lots and lots of uh, working class people who are, uh, who voted for Hillary. I wanna jump off that to the future of the Democratic Party, because we've been talking a lot about the Republicans, and Steve got us to the Democrats, and you just did again. Uh, it is true that the working class or working class voters or blue collar voters, whatever you want to call them, are much more diverse than the stereotype. It's also true if you look at the election results in places like Macomb County, Wisconsin, Pepin County, was, uh, Macomb County, Michigan, Pepin County, Wisconsin, that there were critical blocks of apparently white blue collar voters who had voted twice for Barack Obama. Uh, and it's something that was being caught in the USC Dornsife poll, uh, that switched to Donald Trump. And there's now a dispute about how Democrats should react to this. Uh, do they need to make a renewed effort to reach out to these blue collar voters? Can they? Or is the challenge simply, as a lot of people are suggesting now, simply to motivate the base and make sure it turns out? Well, I do think that it's a bit of a false choice to, in, that we've seen posed since the election in the Democratic Party between, you know, either we have to have an economic message that appeals to working class people or we need to have a cultural message that appeals to um, liberals and, and people of color. I, I think that that's a false choice because uh, a good economic message should appeal to everyone and I don't know any Democrats who actually, you know, it would, be a, it would be a disaster to back off of the party's sort of commitments on social justice, and, and I, I can't believe that that's a serious So discussion. economic justice and social justice I don't think that, I think they go together. However, I would say, in, you know, my, my personal view is that um, in an election where uh, we are seeing this realignment, where places like the Georgia Special reinforce that, places like Orange County here who went for Clinton for the first, first time a Democrat had won in Orange County since FDR, we are seeing a realignment. There are more than enough House districts that Hillary won 
in sunbelt states and places like that where the Democrats could retake the House. You should try to compete everywhere. You should go for those uh, Obama voters who went to Trump. But I think the future of the party, given long-term demographic trends, is you know it's more fruitful ground to continue to uh, go after a, a increasingly diverse, younger, better educated electorate in sunbelt states. When Texas and Arizona were closer, I think, than Iowa, uh, you know, I seems like that's where you should be investing. And Georgia, the Georgia special is a good example of that. It swung 20 points from the last congressional to this one. So you should compete everywhere, try for all those people, find a message that appeals to everyone. But you know, I don't think we should be backing off of you know, our core social justice commitments. And I do think that there is, you know, what Barry Goldwater said, you know, hunt where the ducks are. Um, there are a lot of ducks in, in, in the suburbs who, and I think this was, this was pointed out, who are looking for, like, you know, a non-crazy person who will offer them solutions. And uh, I think Democrats can do that. They just can't lose quite so many of the, of the other people. I'm intrigued by that because when you think about it, these folks voted for Barack Obama twice when he was conspicuously for social justice, when in... 2012, he came out for marriage equality. Uh, are you saying we're less likely to get them back than we are to, to get new voters in Arizona, Georgia, Texas? I mean, I think we underestimate sometimes that there are, it take, there are two candidates in every race, and Mitt Romney not appealing to those people may have been as significant as how much Obama did appeal to them, and it was a race about uh, economics on both sides, labor versus capital, or you know, uh, progressive economics versus conservative economics. It was not a, a race about race, whereas this one was. So I think people came into it with a different frame. You know, uh, uh, we talk, researchers talk about uh, racial priming as a way of, you know, it's not as if your racial consciousness and your identity is static. It, it does change over time. And so when Trump runs a race baiting campaign for two years, then there are voters who are susceptible to that who might not have been, you know, earlier. But, uh, but basically, yes, I am, I am saying that um, you should go after those voters, but that there is a more fruitful ground in these fast-growing suburban uh, you know, places where uh, there's every reason to believe that they've been moving towards Democrats for a while, and that's not true in these shrinking Rust Belt states where um, you, you, might, you might win them back in the next election and you might not, but if people voted for Trump the voters you're not going to get back anytime soon, I don't think, are voters who went for him not in spite of his offensive views and comments, but because of them. And there are some of those. There are a lot of them. And those ones we're not going to win back. If you liked what you heard about immigrant bashing or race baiting, I don't think the Democrats are going to win them, and I'm not sure they should try. Peter, can you put in historical context how parties adapt to what are the constantly changing demographics of the American journey? Wow, Bob, I feel like I need to write a dissertation about that. Um, we don't have time. I know, thank God. <laughs> thank God, for, and lucky for everyone in this room. Um, I, I was gonna, I mean, Bob, I'm gonna twist your question slightly, but I think I'll get to the same, I hope I get to the same point in the end. Because though I'm a historian, I spent a lot of my time learning about the 18th century, I've also learned at the right hand of, of Bob Schrum. And I remember being actually in this room a couple of years ago and hearing a thing that really I've thought about ever since. Um, and it's that voters really respond to the candidate who they think is authentic. Uh, they may disagree with a lot of the policies. It may be hard with the current president to figure out what the policies are from day to day. But there are voters who believe that he, and he doesn't seem to hide anything, you know, comes off as authentic. And I don't mean that in any disrespect um, to his opponent. But I mean, there's something uh, to be said for that. I used to live in Kansas, right? I'm sure everyone on this panel has read What's the Matter with Kansas. And I lived there. As, uh, I have to say, I'm happy that I moved away with all due respect to Kansans. Um, but Kansas was a place where you could look at the election results, and it was constantly people seemed to vote against their own economic interests, time after time. And it's gone on more recently since I came here to California. But they do that for voting for people or for issues that are somehow core to them. And they find ways to sort of just move in a direction. And I think that's ultimately sort of how parties, how society moves. And so when Steve was talking about Silicon Valley before, it's really been on my mind a lot. Does Trump win without Silicon Valley? 
Does Trump win without the brain power that created Twitter, that created the entire way that we talk to each other now and found a way around the, what, what do we call it, the, the mainstream media, I hate that phrase, but whatever. But I mean, there is the sense that politicians and parties adapt to new technologies to try to reach out to core issues, and I think trying to get at a sense of authenticity, which people respond to. There's one man whose name has not been mentioned so far here, and he may be the most popular Democrat in the Democratic Party with the possible exception of Joe Biden uh, and Barack Obama, who obviously can't run again, and that's someone who refuses to say he's a Democrat, Bernie Sanders. Uh, do you see him shaping the future of the party, and does the party lean left or lean further left uh, in reaction to 2016? Um, yeah, I think the answer is yes. I think that he's doing it already, um, and I think he'll continue to do it. I don't see him running for president again, but I, I think he's, he's sort of pulling the party to the left. But on economic issues, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing for the party that tries to win back the White House. I mean, the whole... You know, I agree with it is standard. It is kind of a false choice. I mean, I think Democrats, what the Democrats need to do is expand their economic argument because, and, and this, I'm, without bringing this up again, I, I don't agree with Steve for the most part that it was contempt um, from the East Coast to what's going on. It was ignorance. We saw examples of contempt from Saturday Night Live and what Hillary Clinton said, but what it mostly was is people just didn't know. For whatever reasons, we, you know, reporters screwed up, people just lived different lives here, but. I think it's really important for the Democratic Party to be competitive, to understand the pain that's going on, and to respond to it in a way that President Trump did. And I, you know, I, in a way, the other stuff is almost irrelevant. Um, Sanders gets that. Sanders got that during the election. You know, even, he's, even though he's from Vermont, um, he really understood what was going on in a way I think Trump did. And I think that Democrats need to do that. And I think will. And I think that Sanders is going to help show them that, show them that, show them that direction. Christian, when you look at these election results, how, how do you, what's your read on all this? Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not as uh, in the Bernie Sanders as the future of the Democratic Party camp. I just think that he ran against Hillary Clinton. A lot of people didn't like Hillary Clinton, thus they voted for Bernie Sanders. Um, I think a liberal socialist from Vermont is not the future of the Democratic Party that's going to win. It's definitely the future of the Democratic Party that runs and loses by moving too far to the left. Um, I, I think young voters are really excited about Bernie Sanders, so there is something there. But I think they might have been excited about Elizabeth Warren or about another candidate who is more palatable, possibly, to the liberal part of the wing of the party without having the name socialist attached. Um, I, I could be wrong, but um, I, I also think he just seems... Um, I live in LA and I live in the congressional district where there's just a special election. Trump, I think, got 11% of the vote there. Two candidates advanced to the runoff in the congressional race. They're both Democrats. Neither one of them are Bernie Sanders mm -hmm. people. They're more in the, in the mold of the sort of mainstream Hillary Democrats. So I think somebody who is more mainstream but can talk about economic issues is going to be important. Um, and then also just what is the state of the economy in general, right? If the economy is going really well, Trump's probably going to win, unless he says really off-the-wall things. Well, the economy is not he say going great. <laughs> he's going to probably lose. Right. Uh, I, did you want to say something, Steve? No, I, um, I just, I think like one thing to understand about the Republican Party is like, what, what is the bonding agent, right, that, that holds the Republican Party, its voters together right now? And, and what it is is grievance, right? It's become the grievance party, right? It's aggrieved. And some of the grievances are legitimate, right, in parts of the country, you know, that below the line, again, analogy. And some of those grievances are stokable by demagogic candidates, right, on race and others, you know, like Donald Trump. But, you know, and I, just to disagree back a little bit at Adam, I, one of my favorite moments of any campaign, and it's usually on the morning shows, is when you know, one of the anchors goes on safari to uh, like Youngstown, Ohio, right, to report on the primitive people, right, from, you know, Ohio or, you know, wherever the, the swing district may be, you know, far outside of, you know, far outside of, um, you know, far outside of New York. And I just, no. I just think that there is a profound level of out of touchedness, right, that exists in the country between the people above the line 
and the people and the people below the line. And most importantly, and we haven't talked about this, like kind of what animates like our politics is that you know, we live in an era where trust has completely collapsed in every institution in this country, with one exception, which is the U.S. military. An extraordinary survey, uh, what, what happens when trust collapses is then systems are strained, right? Harvard University study shows that, you know, 80% of people in the 19, born in the 1930s think it is essential to live in a democracy. You know, that number is 25% for people born in the 1980s, and it's lower for, for people that are born uh, that are born in the 1990s. And, um, and, and I think that when you sit there and were there racists who voted for Donald Trump who responded to that message because, for sure. Did Donald Trump win because all of a sudden, right, there's a racist majority in the country? I just think, of course not. You're obviously, by definition, not racist if you voted for Barack Obama and then you, you know, switched over and you, and you, voted, for, you voted for Donald Trump. But I just wonder, and I, and I think that there seems to be an allergy to being able to put from a Democratic perspective themselves into the shoes of the voter who's living in Macomb County, with, uh, Michigan. We talked about Drew's campaign as the Black Lives Matter movement was, was taking off, culturally mainstreaming kind of the words that, you know, kind of there's always new terminologies that come out in an election cycle, white privilege. Um, I do think there is a privilege, you know, for all of our kids, but what about the former coal miner in Huntington, West Virginia? I mean, what's his privilege? And I think that when people hear that in these places where the middle class American dream is gone, it slipped away, where these voters believe their children will not be as well off as they are. That when we talk about immigration, I don't think it is like a direct that they don't like Mexicans. I think what they hear, the focus groups that I've sat in on, is a sense that their American dream is lost. And through their prism, there's protected classes of people they keep cutting in line in front of them. Um, and that what, what drove Trump's candidacy, despite all the ugliness on it, it was in some ways an incredibly optimistic candidacy. In, in the same way, if anyone's ever had like a, a experience with a terminally ill relative, right, and they're in the clinical drug trials, um, and you have to believe it's gonna work. You have to, you have, to have hope. And so when he went to these places and he said, we're going to make the country great again, we're going to, we're going to bring back the jobs, you know, they, they, had to, they had to believe it. And there was a they, they hope required that they, that they believe it. And so in a time where trust has collapsed, you know, the reality was there was, there was never a candidate in the history of the country that's been in the, in the center of the stage for 26 years that we've actually considered making president. I mean, Richard Nixon is the only analogous, and he wasn't famous for a, as long uh, and, and, and as famous as Hillary Clinton was. But I, you know, I just think when you, when you look at this, you know, we talk about all these factors. I mean, the collapse of trust, the, 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 the cultural chasm that's opened up in the country, these, these are all profound factors you know, that, that, are, that are weighing in on this stuff and kind of this time when, you know, the, 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 the ideologies we've become used to have become unmoored from the parties, which I think are increasingly empty vessels, you know, for ambitious politicians. I, I want to get to the near-term electoral consequences of this, but I'm going to let Ron well, just a, 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 Well, just a couple things. I mean, one, uh, I agree Democrats have to do a better job of communicating their care and compassion and plans for these voters. I, I can tell you, Donald Trump doesn't give a rats about them. Of course he doesn't. And, 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 and point one. Point two, just to reiterate something Dan said, a lot of these voters in these towns are black voters, are brown voters. One of those forgotten auto towns is Flint, Michigan, which is now a predominantly African-American town. It obviously has famous problems with its water system. Democrats have been there. Donald Trump hasn't. If you ask me why, I mean, I also think, Steve, some of these areas, you say, well, they, they, it's not about race because they voted for Obama, then they voted for Trump. Look, part of that is 
due to the great credit, and why you'll always be a hero of mine, of John McCain for not stoking these fires in 2008. And, and in standing in a town hall and taking a microphone away from a woman who tried to say Barack Obama wasn't really an American, which then Donald Trump turned to do the centerpiece of his political advocacy for several years. So I mean, leadership matters. And uh, you know, Donald Trump led in a direction, and it had consequences. In the end, I think the key for Democrats is some combination of, one, uh, staying faithful to and rallying our uh, our base, these social justice issues, to doing a better job of articulating our views on these economic issues, but three, calling out the fact that Donald Trump will not deliver for these voters who, who did put some level of trust in him, enough trust in him to elect him president. He is not going to bring back their jobs. He is not going to really enact tax policies. And I think disaffecting them from Trump is step one in bringing them back into our fold. Okay, I want to talk about the next step electorally, 2018. Uh, Democrats are at a disadvantage in the Senate with 25 seats up to the Republicans having nine. Uh, the House, the problem is gerrymandering but, and, and the concentration of Democrats in urban districts. But given that the Democratic base now seems to be so energized, could the midterm pattern that's traditional be broken? The pattern where Democrats show up in presidential races but they don't show up in midterms. Are these people who are marching now going to actually walk to the polls in 2018? And if so, is it conceivable that Democrats could even take back the House? I'll start with you, Dan. Well, I think so. I mean, as I said earlier, that, uh, there are enough just with districts that Hillary won. There are enough um, to swing the House. I think you know we um, we've seen so far specials in Kansas and Georgia where there was a 20 point swings in both, uh, in both districts towards Democrats. Whether it can be sustained to 2018 is another question, but um, you're right that, that in the last several midterms, Democratic constituencies have, have, had, um, have had problems turning out, but you, know, you, you don't have to go 2006, the last time there was a midterm with a Republican president, Democrats did pretty well. So I think there is, if, if current trends continue, I think there's every reason to believe that it will be a good day for Democrats, whether they can take back the Senate and the House, I, I don't know, but I think they should make strong gains. I want to give Adam and Krishna a chance to weigh in on this. Yeah, the other point, I agree, the other point I would make um, is that, you know, we don't know where these Republican voters and these Trump voters are going to be come 2018. And, you know, right now, you know, we're seeing these 100-day reports, including, I guess, the poll this morning that shows, oh, they're all for them and happy. But if we're two years in and the economy is slowing down, which could certainly be the case, if health care hasn't happened, if the tax reform hasn't happened, if, God forbid, we're in a war with name the country you want to name. Canada. Canada. <laughs> Canada. <laughs> right, Canada. <laughs> um, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that those voters are going to come out and vote for Democrats, but I'm going to I'm say that a lot of them might not come out. So I think that... Um, that it is really possible that Democrats take back the House. The idea of Democrats taking back the Senate seems more uh, on Mars, not totally impossible, but seems much more alive. I'd say more on the moon. On the moon. Yeah, okay. Chris. Yeah, so uh, one thing I think we haven't talked about for the Democrat strategy in the midterms is there's a natural surge and decline that happens in midterm elections and presidential years, so the Democrats should do better in the House. The question is, are they going to win two or three seats? Are they going to take things back? So in 06, there's a big scandal, Mark Foley, that affected the Republican Party. In 2002, Republicans did fine, even though it was a midterm. There wasn't a major scandal, and there's the specter of 9-11. 1974, there was the Watergate scandal, right? So I think if, if the Democrats should, re the, I mean, they're doing this, the Democrats should focus on the corruption aspect, whether it's perceived and not real or real, going into the midterm elections combined with this natural surge and decline, and then they're likely to do better Otherwise, it might just be a few um, seats that will be picked up. Uh, Peter? I think, sorry, Steve, I think something has happened to our politics, right? I mean, we're just talking about, or you're accepting the idea that people will walk into a voting booth uh, and assume that their vote is about what happens at the national level. You know, it wasn't that long ago that we did talk about politics being local. And I do wonder, and you guys know this much better than I do. I mean, do Americans go to a voting booth to vote for somebody? Or if that person's name is not on the ballot, as Trump's won't be in 18, will they go to vote against him if his name is not there? I mean, don't, isn't it a question of 
of fielding really strong candidates who, who do the groundwork and get out of the You're saying is the election going to be nationalized? And I think I'm sure answer. it'll be nationalized, yeah, but yeah. I'm saying can Democrats win without also having a strong local ground game, local candidates local game. who yeah. are, no, who are engaging to them. Yeah, because people vote. won't just go and say, I hate Trump, I'm going to vote. They will stay home if there's not someone to vote for who they like. That's all I meant. Okay. So I, I think the Democrats are going to win back the House in 2018. I mean, there's been three... I mean, only three times in the last 100, it'll be 118 years, has the incumbent president's party picked up seats in the first midterm election. So history tells us that, you know, the, the Democrats will, will pick up seats. I think that, you know, Trump has uh, energized the party. Uh, I think that they are united in going out and casting an oppositional, you know, an, an oppositional vote. And, and Republicans, I think, will be disaffected because Obamacare and all the domestic agenda they talked about, none of those, you know, none of those things are going to happen. Um, this Georgia 6 special election is significant and similar to, if you go back to 93 in the first midterm after Bill Clinton, there were two districts on the Mississippi River in Kentucky, the Kentucky 1 and 2, that had never voted for a Republican candidate in the history of the, you know, in, in, in the history of the country, and they both voted for Republicans in specials. Republicans have the big 94 year. In this Georgia 6 election, you know, Mitt Romney won this district with 66 percent. Uh, Donald Trump barely won it at, at 49 percent. And there are more than enough districts that, you know, as Nancy, the Hillary Clinton won that, um, you know, could, could drop in reverse. And I, and I do think that, you know, and I have a personal point of view is you don't want to see either one of these two parties with like complete control of government. And I think that there will be a, be a reset towards that. Geez, I wouldn't mind if one party controlled government, but I won't say what it is. Uh, uh, I do have a question for you about the Republican party. And then I want to ask a final question about the Democrats and then open this up. Uh, President Trump, according to uh, representative Mark Sanford, and we don't have to talk more about him, uh, has threatened to primary some Republican members of Congress if they don't go along with them. Uh, Sanders said that's counterproductive. Is it, and will it ever really happen? Would Trump really do this? I just was struck when you said President Trump. It never, you get never get used to it. But um, <laughs> the, um, look, I, I think that, you know, if you threaten somebody, you better deliver on the threat. Right, so typically in politics, right, he's not the first governor or president that's threatened, if you don't do what I say, I'm going to primary you. Um, in almost every instance that I can think of, right, they failed to deliver on the threat and thus they're weakened. I mean, very famously on the, um, on the Obamacare repeal vote, you had Steve Bannon summon everybody to the meeting and threaten them in the you know, in the Eisenhower Executive Office building. And it's just not how politics, how politics works. And um, so I think, um, you know, I, I, look, I think that, you know, like, like politicians, elected politicians as a, as a species of humans distinct from the rest of us have finely honed instincts for survival. So you think about these Republicans looking at Donald Trump, they relate to Donald Trump at his 42% approval level quite differently than they're going to relate to him at his 32% approval. And so, you know, his trading range, I think, is going to be between 35 to 42%. And he may go as low as 32, you know, 30, 31. Um, but you remember, I mean, Donald Trump won by 100,000 votes, you know, across three states. He pulled an inside straight, he lost the popular vote by 3 million. And, you know, in order for him to be reelected, it requires the Democratic Party to nominate, you know, fundamentally an unelectable candidate. So we have a contest, you know, again, between two historically unpopular candidates that definitionally would be viewed as unelectable and in a two person race two unelectable candidates, one of the unelectable candidates is going to win. So that brings me to my other question, unless somebody feels compelled to comment on this, on this issue. Uh, we talked about the Democratic Party message, economic justice, social justice, but a lot of people say the party lacks a messenger for 2020. And I'll start with you, Dan. 
who should the party look to, and what are they looking for? And you, and and I'll say, assume that Hillary Clinton doesn't run, which I think make is, it easier I think is a you. good assumption. Uh, I don't have a, a preferred candidate, but I, uh, Ron and I were talking about this earlier. I do feel like having watched the last two contested Democratic primaries, uh, that no one is going to be nominated who cannot appeal to voters of color, uh, especially in the South. I think that is why Obama beat Clinton. It's why Clinton beat Sanders. And anyone who thinks that they're going to that there's a different winning coalition in the Democratic Party, I just haven't, we haven't seen it. And so um, I think, uh, you know, does that help Cory Booker? I, I don't know. I don't, I, don't, I don't think it necessarily has to mean the, the candidate has to be a person of color, but I do think that no one is going to win a Democratic nomination by saying we should be talking more to white men and less to women and people of color. That is a losing proposition in a primary. Peter, I'm not going to compel you to come up with someone. Well, but. Good thing. Um, but I would say, I think, and I'm not knowing who the party would come up with, I do think that um, they need, the party needs somebody who can master the media of that moment, uh, who is telegenic, who is quick, uh, who is willing to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with someone, um, someone who seems to go back to this word, you know, authentic. I mean, I think that you can be the smartest person in the room and lose. Um, and I think you can analyze a lot of votes, you know, and a lot of patterns. But I think really they need someone who is just going to reach out to voters in some direct way. And these guys are better experts than me and who that would be. But it will be someone who will master whatever is the media of that moment. That is what we've seen in American politics, frankly, since the start. Ron? Well, I'm, I'm going to cop out and not give a name, but I'm not going to give a name for this reason. Uh, you know, I think the leadership struggle in the Democratic Party uh, over the past eight years has been centered around two questions. How did you respond to the 2008 financial collapse? And how did you vote on the war in Iraq? And those have been the driving cutting lines in our party over the past eight years. And I do not think in 2020 those two very backward-looking dividing lines is going to be what decides who our party nominates. I think it's going to be more defined by who was the most effective in responding to Trump and building a new agenda, so on and so forth. So I think when you look at the field today and you still align these people around, you know, how anti-Wall Street were they in 2008, how anti-Iraq war were they in 2005 or 2008, you know, the, the, those have been the tests of leadership in our party until now, or the dividing lines, and I think those dividing lines are going to change, and it's still too soon to say how that will sort out. Adam? Um, yeah, I'm going to dodge on the name thing, too. But I am going to say... I knew that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think it's going to be a particularly interesting election because I think that the, the bar has been lowered for who the Democratic candidate could or might be for two reasons. One is that people are... Democrats are really freaked out about Trump, obviously. And I think people, as Steve said very convincingly, people think that Trump's beatable. So... I think we'd have a lot of Democrats in the race who might not have been in the race normally because they might not be ready and people that we have not thought of. And, um, um, you know, I, I, yeah, it's almost a name. But I, I just think we'd have a lot of people in the race, younger people and people that in a normal year might not be considered experienced enough to be run for president or be president. But I think that's all out the window in the era of Trump. Christian? Yeah, so I think that the general election, assuming Trump's approval numbers stay where they are, any Democrat who's breathing not incompetent <laughs> and is an elected official with a little bit of experience. And so I think Kamala Harris has a pretty good chance because she could win the primary by winning California, getting a lot of delegates. If Cory Booker doesn't run, African-American support, female support, do well in the South, do well in California, that's probably enough to get enough delegates for the convention. I think it's a lot like 08. Getting that nomination is going to mean a lot. Now, that's, that means... Um, that's assuming the economy is not going gangbusters. If the economy is going great, Trump can win. But um, but I think he's if he remains this unpopular, you know, Kamala Harris, Amy Klobuchar, look to the Midwest. One of the reasons Obama did well, those are the states where they're that are becoming the swing states now. Um, that's why I think the Democrats. Look Steve, at. I'll bet you disagree with this. Any Democrat can win theorem. Yeah, I, look, I I think that I think what's true presidential politics is that the next president will always possess oppositional virtues to the last president, and they're not experiential virtues, they're character virtues. And so 
I'm not sure who that is in the Democratic Party, other than to say we were on the set of Morning Joe and I, the Democratic congressman from Ohio who challenged Nancy Pelosi, Tim Ryan. Mm -hmm. And he's a, he's a very nice guy, very articulate, and he sat down. I joked around with him. I said, wow, I said, you're awfully young looking for a leader in the Democratic Party. And he just, you know, he started and he started laughing. And so I think when you look at the Obama years and the amount of seat losses that Democrats have sustained, you have a hollowing out of the bench. And I think that the nominee is more likely than not to come out of the side of the may not be particularly ready, but are at the, at the right moment. And I, and I think that there's people, we were talking before, I, Seth Moulton, a congressman from Massachusetts, Marine combat veteran, multiple tours, decorated for valor, Harvard, Harvard University, uh, good on TV. Um, you know, I don't know how he does shaking hands, but I think, you know, what, what we've learned over the last couple of debates is if you can get up on that stage um, and you can perform as an athlete, right, that you can do well in those debates, it triggers the, it triggers the fundraising, and you're, and you're off to the races, and none of the traditional entry points, the ability to have a big field organization overnight in Iowa or to have all of those endorsements, I think it is much more a disruptive process um, and, you know, much more <clears throat> uber than, you know, typical machine machine politics. So I, I think it's just couldn't be more wide open. So an Uber, not a taxi cab. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think we, we have some time for some questions now. Uh, sure, all the way in the back, in the blue. That's you, you're looking around, they're bringing you a mic. <laughs> Hi, so Steve's point about um, contempt uh, brought like an interesting misperception, I think, to my attention, which is that the term elite seems to be shorthand for Democrat amongst these uh, rural working class white voters. Uh, they seem to equate the two, which I suspect might be because many of the elites that are visible, so the elites of Silicon Valley, the elites in the media, are the ones that they can see, but the elites that are less publicly visible are the ones who are actually supporting policies that actively hurt their interests, economic and otherwise. Uh, and so I'm wondering to what extent any of you think that conflation might be part of why they seem to be voting against some of their interests on occasion, and possibly the swing from Obama to Trump. Ron, you want to? Well, a couple of things. I mean, one, I don't think it's just Democrats. I mean, you know, Ted Cruz did try this line that Donald Trump reflected New York values um, and uh, whatever that was supposed to mean. And uh, so, so I, I, I do think there is mutual contempt here a, a little bit that needs to be d dialed back and, 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 and dialed down. But I, but I think, look, I think that um, uh, overall, uh, I, I also want to just, uh, this whole thing about the Obama voters who voted for Trump, I, I think that's a little bit of um, a, a, a weak piece of analysis in the sense that there are definitely counties that went for Obama that went for Trump. It doesn't mean there were necessarily voters who voted for Obama who voted for Trump. What happened in a lot of predominantly white counties in Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin is a ton of people who didn't vote in 2008 or 2012 showed up and voted in 2016. And that flipped a lot of these counties. You had incredibly high levels of, of turnout. And uh, among, among white, rural, working class voters. And so, you know, to me, in the end, the Democratic strategy here is, is not around kind of ele elevating their elites and building more hate for their elites and our elites and their elites and all this stuff. To me, it's more around reaching those voters and first persuading them that Trump is not going to deliver for them, has not delivered for them, is not delivering for them. And then I do think it's incumbent on us to explain to them what we would do for them, how we would create economic growth and vitality in some of these forgotten parts of the country. 
I have to note that one of the strengths of the USC Daybreak poll was that it didn't do what most polls did. It didn't throw out people who hadn't voted in 2012 and 2014. It allowed them to express their opinion, and it detected that a lot of those people were going to come out and vote for Trump. Somebody else have a question? Uh, somebody who hasn't asked. You haven't asked, right? Yeah. No, OK. Go ahead. Hi, thanks for coming. Uh, you, I just have a quick question about the potential possibility of a centrist candidate. Is, there, is it possible that somebody could run in 2018 for a Senate seat in, say, like Ohio, like maybe Sherrod Brown might have to run as more of a centrist candidate to capture some of those voters that uh, Secretary Clinton clearly lost out on in 2016? Like some, somebody like Kamala Harris can, you know, be as anti-Trump as she wants to because she's not going to lose any support in California, at least, even if she wants to run for Senate again if she doesn't run for president. But somebody like Sherrod Brown is in Ohio, I think, is at risk of losing his seat in 2018 if he doesn't, you know, at least play to the middle a little bit. So to what extent do certain Democratic candidates in swing states have to be more centrist? Or do they have to just mobilize the base on the left as much as possible and increase turnout there instead of compromising to the middle? Anyone who wants to take that can take it. Well, I, the, what, one, I'll just say one brief thing. I, I've actually been shocked by uh, how relatively moderate to conservative Democrats have voted against Trump in the House and Senate so far and don't feel that pressure. I mean, on the Supreme Court nomination, Trump only got three Democratic votes, including Claire McCaskill, who's one of the most vulnerable Democrats from the most moderate parts of the country who felt free to vote against Donald Trump on the one vote he really tried hard to get Democrats on. So what I say is thus far with Trump's approval rating as, as low as it is, as Steve alluded to, uh, with him being as provocative and as divisive as he's been with him not really making any effort to reach out to Democrats, I think Democrats are able to oppose him pretty much with impunity. And, and I don't think they, they feel any pushback against that uh, even in these more swing closely divided states. It also sort of gets to a, a debate about what actually happened in those states. Because if you think that um, it's about populism and not about moderation, then uh, Br Senator Brown can be populist, which is what he wants to be, and do fine. He doesn't, he doesn't have to tack to the middle if, uh, just because it's a, it's a red state. If it's a populist red state, then he's, then he's fine. If you think that actually that's a misreading of what happened and you look at, you know, Portman and Kasich being very popular in Ohio and, and like, um, uh, you know, if you look at the results of the Senate race in Wisconsin and, and how, how well um, the Republicans have, have won in state races there, uh, then maybe you would say, well, maybe you, sh you do need to worry. Maybe it isn't the, just that being sort of populist is enough. But that is one of the questions that I think Democrats are wrestling with. And, and certainly the Sanders wing of the party would say the answer is to go more left, not to go to the center. But I, I do think that that's an open question. Time for a couple more questions. Leslie? So I know the panel may disagree with this premise, but just to suspend disbelief, could you argue the possibility that the U.S. still has a cultural roadblock against um, electing a woman as president? So just arguing, just take the opposite point of view. <laughs> you uh, may disagree with the, the moderator is just going to say, yes, yeah, the moderator is just going to say it's tougher for a woman to get elected president, and I think more and more social science evidence is going to show that. Yeah, can I just speak to that? There's one study by Brian Schaffner and a co-author, or co-author too, that looked at a support for Trump versus Clinton and compared the vote for um, Obama in 08 versus McCain. And basically, attitudes about traditional roles for women in, in the House were correlated heavily with support for Trump, less so for Republicans in previous elections. So there's a little bit potentially going on there in the data. Racial resentment was also big, economic factors and all the things we've talked about too. I just don't think anybody would disagree. Or I mean, maybe people would. I, is there anyone in this panel who disagrees that, that there's a barrier for a woman and it's a higher hurdle and there's more to overcome? I, I obviously agree, but I, I would add one wrinkle to it, which is that I, that I think will come up in the future, which is that I think we took, because the only, because Hillary was the only, is the only data point we have, 
she brought obviously a whole bunch of her own weaknesses that were, and limitations that had nothing to do with being a woman and then a whole set of challenges that did have to do with being a woman and they were in some ways related. But it's hard because we only have the one example to disaggregate them. I think one of the strengths that she brought that is, was sort of unique to her was her credibility on national security. And the long time knock uh, you know, on women candidates was you know, they're not gonna be not seen as, as tough enough on security. That didn't really happen to Hillary even though um, you know, she, she exit polls showed, she, you know, Trump won ter voters who cared about terrorism, but lost voters who cared about foreign policy. I think for other women running in 2020 who do not, who were not Secretary of State, didn't sit on the Armed Services Committee, don't have that reputation as sort of the longtime Iron Lady, uh, I think we will see that particular barrier come back with a vengeance. I think you will see, you know, uh, if sort of for a Klobuchar or a Elizabeth Warren or a Kamala Harris or a Kirsten Gillibrand who are not associated with national security primarily, I think you're going to see a whole host of problems on the national security front because they are because of their gender. And I think that's something we didn't see as much of this time because of Hillary was unique, but I two, think we will. Yeah, two, two. Yes, ma'am. Well, I haven't heard that ever that word in so long. I forgot about superdelegates. It, it seems like 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know what people are going to say. I would point out one thing: the superdelegates have never dared to become a poison pill. That is to overturn the results of the primaries. Uh, and if they had, I think the Democratic Party would that year have exploded. Uh, does anybody else have anything on this? The, the, I think the Republicans wish they had superdelegates, right? So that's, that would be the counterfactual. Um, yeah. Yes, sir. All the way in the back. Uh, yes. Someone mentioned on the panel, I think you were talking about the uh, two-party system and that it's, you know, old and dodgy and kind of lumbers along. But don't you think that you know, the two-party system in the United States has offered stability to this country for a very, very long time. And so moving forward, it's hard for me to, and it's entrenched too, so it's hard for me to see that certainly in my lifetime or in the next 50 years, somehow it's going to be dismantled or molded into something else. And for as much as people talk about how bad it is, can you comment on the benefits that it's given the country over this tremendous long period of time that it's existed. Peter? Oh. <laughs> you don't have I to mean, do a lengthy conversation. No, 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 but, I, but just or quickly, I mean, I mean, if you wanted to run that the other way, I mean, you would say, you know, did we go into the Civil War in 1860 because there were more than two parties, you know, which there were at the time. I mean, is it really the two-party system that provided stability, or is there some really core understanding that ties us together as a nation that provides for the political stability. And I would argue it's, it's that, that it's not the two-party system. I think the two-party system we have now, um, historians are terrible at predicting the future, you know, so I won't, but I don't think that that accounts for our stability. John, you have a panelist privilege. Quick question. Um, watching Marco Rubio and John Kasich go and do in the morning shows and practicing messaging, how do you handicap uh, the possibility that Trump gets primary? I think it's, well, <laughs> not by Marco Rubio. Um, what, why? I like to disagree. I was curious. What you... Because you know him, like, right? the, risk, the risk reward calculus doesn't, doesn't pencil out. Okay. Um, and, you know, John Kasich seems to be intimating, you know, when he's, kind of moving beyond both parties, you know, they're both broken. Is there a potential independent candidacy there? You know, uh, you know who knows? Um, but I, I think it's tough to primary, you know, from the, look, Trump, Trump will have to be in a, in a state of pretty abject weakness, um, you know, at the time. And I, look, I, and I'm someone who, you know, when I get asked this, like, I, I don't see, like, any scenarios where this turns out well. Like where, you know, he's going to like, hey, oh, my God, he turned out to be a great president. Um, the, uh, you know, I, I think that there's a, uh, that there's a uh, you know, tremendous chance that like a lot of, a lot of bad things are, you know, a lot of bad things are going to happen. Yeah. 
This, uh, we have one other thing to do, and I want to say it's been a wonderful day and a wonderful panel, and I'll thank them at the end, but I want to introduce uh, for a few closing remarks, and I think they're brief, uh, because I know her very well, the remarkable dean of USC Dornsife, who's also a remarkable scientist, without whom this conference would not have happened, and who has given such support to practical politics and to political science and to the Unruh Institute, uh, the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Amber Miller. Thank you, Bob, and thank you for having me. Um, on behalf of USC, I'd like to thank all of the participants in today's discussions, as well as the Political Science Department and the Jesse M. Unruh Institute of Politics. And a special thanks, of course, to its director, Bob Schrum, who brought us all together. I hope you'll stay with me for the next two hours, my closing remarks. <laughs> um, lots of great discussion today, um, and much left to be sorted out. I suspect that there are a lot of things that we don't agree on, but one thing we probably all do agree on is that the challenges we face today are incredibly complex. And we're facing them as a more divided nation than at almost any other time in our nation's history. Today's conversations have been a breath of fresh air for me. We used to talk about the art of debate because debate takes creativity, concentration, and technique. This art seems to have gone missing from so much of the debate these days, but I heard it here today. It's heartening to watch such an impressive group of experts from both inside and outside the academy with a wide range of perspectives and approaches grapple with the tough questions that we talked about today in a smart and honest way. What Professor Schramm has brought to our initiative in practical politics, including today's conference, is a shiny example of the kind of engagement that I believe we need more of at today's research universities. My broader goal as a university leader, and specifically as the new dean here at USC Dornsife, is to find creative ways to connect the ideas that we're generating within the academy to real world issues faced by today's society in a two-way dialogue. I look forward to expanding conversations like those today to other specific issues, such as sustainability and the environment, refugees and displaced populations, and global economic disparity. With these fundamental questions facing us in terms of what needs to get done to sustain humanity and the planet and serve the global public good, we have no choice but to figure out a multilateral, bipartisan approach. I believe that our research universities provide an environment that's uniquely conducive to both this kind of thought and action that effectively responds to these questions. We are places that generate new knowledge and prepare the next generation of leaders. But universities can also be places that engage with our communities in ways that make what we do more relevant and in ways that create more impact. Facts do matter, and so does science. The very troubling data that we saw this morning demonstrates that we are not working from a common set of facts. And it makes clear to me that universities need to step up. My ambition for USC Dornsife is for us to become a national hub for convening groups of people intent on generating fact-based solutions to the world's most challenging problems. There is expertise right here in this room to do it, academics, political operatives, journalists, public servants, and others. I believe that if we get it right, universities can be some of the most important convening spaces for developing the best solutions to complex problems. And we can also serve as honest brokers that help America reestablish our long tradition of inclusivity and finding common ground. We saw this clearly on display today, conversations ba based on facts and respect in spite of positions that are often at odds. The breakdown of civility in the last election cycle, not only among politicians themselves, but also that which pervaded the media and the American public cannot define us. America is a nation with a long history of coming together in the most trying times by relying on a process that values cooperation. Two quotes come to mind from the mid 20th century when America's political climate was still fierce and fractured, but the discourse was at least mostly civil. Republican President Dwight Eisenhower said, this world of ours must avoid becoming a community of dreadful fear and hate and be instead a proud confederation of mutual trust and respect. 
and Democratic President Franklin Roosevelt reminded us in 1938 that democracy cannot succeed unless those who express their choices are prepared to choose wisely. The real safeguard of democracy, therefore, is education. I hope so. And I hope you will continue to join us as we take on additional pressing and timely issues. Today's conference was part of the UNRWA Institute's Academy in the Public Square series that will take place at USC Dornsife over the next academic year. These public forums will focus on hot button issues such as millennial voters, climate change, and domestic terrorism. We thank Hope Warshaw, a longtime supporter of USC, for graciously sponsoring this upcoming series. We'll have more event information on these events and others coming soon. Thank you all again for joining us here at USC, and back to Bob and the panel. I should have said College of uh, Letters, Arts, and Sciences, but I didn't, uh, or Arts, Letters, and Sciences. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dean Miller because I really mean it. Without her help, we wouldn't be here and we wouldn't be able to do this. I also want to thank the staff of the Unruh Institute and the Political Science Department and my colleagues in the Political Science Department, all of whom work so hard on this. I thank the panelists, my friends that I imposed on, others that I imposed on anyway, even if I didn't know them all that well, uh, and Ari and Jill, who kicked this thing off with some very illuminating information. <clears throat> Thank you all very much. As, a, as an audience, you have been terrific. And you get, if you're asking for grades, an A. <laughs> Thank you.